Orville wanted to make the guitar become center point for the musician. And so he makes it bigger and he makes it louder. And he proves the concept with his first guitar in 1898. Once he does that, he then moves on to creating beautification on the instrument. And that is something that he was highly interested in and that we continue to this day. You know, Gibson guitars have always been super expressive in their look. At the time, most of the instruments that were acoustic at the time were coming in with the immigration of, from Europe, Italy, you know, and Spain. They were acoustic instruments. Many of them were folk instruments and they were kind of crudely built. And Orville had a vision of making something superior to that. One of the things I love about our acoustic guitars is the whole legacy of artistic vision for the instruments. Gibson was the first to develop these awesome uh, pieces of art. The guitar, again, was a, such a tool for the artists, not only musically, but aesthetically. It was part of their look and, and their stage persona. So your guitars, they've been neck fit, they've been whitewood sanded, they've been prepped, they've been inspected, they're ready to do the spray booth process. The guitars need to be in the right position and condition to receive paint and lacquer. First step will be what we call wash coat. It's just a product that goes on the bodies, the necks, all the wood surfaces to better prep that particular wood for the receiving of paint and lacquer. Gives it a smoother surface to go on and just helps it maintain the integrity of the adhesion between the paint and the wood. Uh, so this is wash coat. So what it is, unless most guitars come from white wood, uh, they come through here, we hang up on the line, uh, we take a uh, tack cloth, wipe down any excess dust off of them, and then we uh, apply wash coat to them, and then we let that dry, and then they go on to fill afterwards. Once that's done, with the exception of maple, which is very hard, very glassy, all the other woods we use, they have pits, they have pores. They're not really super flat if you look at them really close up. If you were to put paint and lacquer on woods like rosewood, walnut, mahogany, koa, eventually that paint and lacquer would conform to the contour of the wood. Uh, we always like to say it would look like an orange peel. So in order to eliminate that, we use what's called a wood filler. It's a thick paste, and we have it in varying shades to kind of match the tonality of the specific species of wood. So I think our variations for difference in color really comes down to standard spruce tops or thermal tops. You get a considerably different finish on a thermal top than you would just standard spruce. A lot of different variations on the bodies for mahogany and such. Um, you get more variations on that based on wood fills and just pre-prepping them, getting that ready, you get a lot different tone based on what's underneath it. Part of getting the right shade for the right models is just sealing up and getting them prepped right as far as uh, priming them, sealing them up. So basically once you have your guitar on the jig, which is what this machine is called, you're going to take a uh, scuff pad and you want to scuff the entire surface of the guitar. This is going to remove any like liner scratches or anything like that. So now it's uh, ready to be filled, and uh, this guy is a J45, so it's gonna get walnut filled. You just want a nice, even, smooth coat on the outside of the guitar. And then once the guitar is uh, fully wiped off, or at least as much as I can, I'll be filled. We're gonna take it off the jig, and then we're gonna move into this rug. In the wiping off process, it stays down in the indentations, just kind of giving you a glassier surface for that paint and lacquer that's going to be coming along shortly. Guitars next are prepped for the color booth area. We need to mask off the binding on the fingerboard, we mask off the rosette, and in some cases, say a dove with a natural top. It's gonna to be cherry backsides and neck, but the top is gonna to be natural. So they will take paper and tape, mask off the top so that way they can spray it without worrying about getting any of that color in areas where it's not supposed to be. Now we do not mask off the body binding at this point in time. We'll show you what the result of that process is farther down the road, but we go ahead and just spray right over the binding with any color that's going to be applied to the guitar.
It has to be a uniform shape and a uniform color and a uniform tone. So I have to just make sure that I'm always staying within what's expected of a Gibson, what it's supposed to look like. It has to have that uniform look in order for it to get out the door. One of the things that Gibson has always been famous for is the vintage, what we call the vintage sunburst, dark to light in the middle. Started back in the 20s with the small body guitars that we created, which were the first guitars built the way we build them now. Into the 30s and the 40s, the iconic banner year J45s. It's always just been something that Gibson has hung its hat on. Incredibly convoluted process. It's amazing historically how accurate and how consistent this process has been done, considering how difficult it is. It goes from brown to yellow. We have different varying shades. A sunburst can go from almost black to a yellow center, from a honey burst to an amber center. There's a lot of variations in what we call a sunburst. There's cherry sunbursts, but all of them take the same amount of complexity, same amount of time to do. And when you see that look, that's definitely Gibson. That's something we have just, uh, we created and we just love the visual of the vintage sunburst guitar. The color booth covers a lot of ground. One thing that's cool about our, our Gibson product is the fact that we're not pigeonholed into any one thing. You look at a wall of Gibsons, they're all different. They all look spectacular, but the colors, the body shapes, the designs make it fun. The learning curve definitely takes some time. You know, you progress differently, certain colors a little more challenging. You kind of just naturally progress along color lines to more transparent colors, a little more even finishes. It really takes, you know, I'd say probably about normally a year, year and a half for people to really get comfortable and efficient and speed wise, quality wise, to really have a grasp of being able to do everything we do here. Really it's just, it probably comes down to a lot of paint control, just adjusting and knowing what finish we're working with. Each color is a little bit different, a little bit, you just kind of get a feel for it, but it's really just kind of attacking it, applying it on and, and just having your own sense of making adjustments. Over the years, I guess we've had a little bit of opportunity to mix paint and kind of create some of our own colors. We've got a few that have become core colors for us. Our wine red we mix and the progressive paint we made in-house and had, had that just replicated and given to us. In these spray booths, they not only do the bursts, they also do the beautiful cherries, wine reds, viper blues. Once the guitar have their desired color and their finish being painted, they then move on to what we call antiquing, which is another process that's fascinating. A lot of the different color changes comes from the antiquing process. You know, different binding gets colored differently, whether it's historic antique or double antique, triple antiques. So by taking all of these concepts and building the instrument, taking from the violins, applying the carved tops, and then looking at how to create beautification, it really attracted attention. The instruments were louder, they were more durable, they were flashy, and that led to, over time, these instruments being observed and valued by many players who then seeked Gibson to make their instruments. To me, the thing I love about Gibsons is just the history behind it. I mean, we kind of stay within what I feel like is our Gibson pocket. You know, it's kind of always been that way. Everything we change is pretty subtle. It's not huge, drastic changes. A lot of it is just, we've been around for so long, so it's ours. We've just kind of always done it the way we do it. Orville Gibson visualized they should be built like an orchestral violin. It was his vision, and it's, it still holds true today. And it's why the guitars we build in Bozeman are built not the easy way, the hard way, because it sounds better.